Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is the optional title for my talk, Personalization at TVNRK and Radio uh, with Orleans and Actor Modeling. My name is uh, Harald schulter uh, I work for Aurum AS, a small consultancy, um, and I'm currently uh, with NRK on the radio team, uh, and I've been working on personalization. Personalization is uh, something that cuts between both radio and TV, so uh, there's a team member from uh, both products. Now, this is not a uh, one-man thing we've created. Uh, there's product owners, uh, leaders, there's um, uh, UX, UI testers, application developers, etc. Um, so this is just not me. Uh, there's more people behind this. Um, the agenda is sort of why why we went with an actor uh, system for this. Um, and then we have the um, some details on the implementation, just to give a look into that. We will look at operations of how how are we running uh, something like okay, uh, uh, an actor system uh, on Kubernetes. And then there's some lessons learned uh, uh, during the last year or so. So um, TV NRK.no is uh, the equivalent of uh, BBC uh, and uh, the iPlayer and uh, so when you open up the front page uh, what you get uh, just under the big uh, hero image is my content, your content, things you have watched, things you have marked as a favorite, things you um, things that are yours we are not putting anything else in there which you have not um, you have not acted on so this is all your content um, this is a screenshot from the old one, so that was so now as from the front page using the new version, and, and this is um, the my page uh, with the old system where we had the continue watching at the top, um, and then there were uh, your shows below that, and then the history underneath. Uh, another view of these data. This is a uh, documentary, Nature Series. You can see that I watched the two first episodes, or rather my kids have, and then they have uh, uh, are somewhere in the beginning of the third episode. Uh, and uh, well, the problem with this, the old solution, was that people couldn't really find their content. They, although they had these favorites and, and um, resume watching, having two different things that were yours were troubling. Um, as a public broadcaster, we have on some shows uh, fairly short rights because we don't do DRM. So um, uh, you can often uh, ex um, see that you have watched episode one and it, it's probably lost rights before we publish episode seven. So you sort of need to keep track with us. And then there's this one. And that's a problem, and most do that wrong, and we want to do this right. We want to take you to the right place. So what happens if you're on episode four, and we get rights for episode five? Should we notice you? Should we put that content further up? The screen on the cell phone, uh, or on the smart TV, there's not room for that many items, so we want to make sure that the items we show you on your content is relevant, depending on where you are as an individual. Not, not that, okay, we got new season, perhaps interesting for a lot of people, but it's re what we want to try to hit is, is if it's relevant where you are. And, and so that is one thing for sequential content, but then we have other types of series. We have news shows. If you're on iWatch Saturdays, so uh, seven days ago, the next episode I want to watch, is that six days ago or is it today's episode? So that is also something we need to solve. And then, um, to do this, when you have a small viewport, we wanted to be dynamic, to change the content. It's still your content, and we wanted to sort of be active. If we get rights, we want to perhaps put it up. If you're losing rights in six days and you're halfway into an episode, we want to put that one up to make sure that you get the chance to watch it before we take it away. Um, so that's one reason we needed or wanted to build a new system or, or do something about it. And then we had the old architecture, uh, where we had a web API, we had a Redis, we had a document storage. Uh, we loaded, once you logged in, we loaded your data into Redis, and um, well, that 
works fine if you have enough Redis instances. Um, and we run in Azure, where Redis is uh, not the cheapest product they have. Um, and, and we're doing Lua script on Redis, so it means that Redis is single-threaded, so if we have an expensive Lua script, everything is slow unless we add enough Redis instances. And when we made this back in 2014-15, things looked like this. Uh, this is also called a big ball of mud. The red ones are circular dependencies between namespace. Yay! <laughs> that sounds like fun. Uh, and then we were slightly moving into microservice bounded context, trying to split uh, our domain based on functionality. And that sort of made it easier for us to, to start reasoning about how they should work. Um, and we sort of decided, okay, we want to do something about personalization. And then we have a rule that if you're doing something big, something uh, that needs a decision, you present at least three options. And it should be presented as by the team or I by one person. It's not that I present one and you present one, because then, then you get my decision, my, my system, your solution kind of battle. We want to sort of present three equal options. In this case, we ended up with sort of looking at five. OK, we go the old way with Redis and, and see if that could work. And we were fairly certain that we didn't want it. We, it was one of the most expensive components we had in our Azure stack. Uh, SQL, yeah, probably. But that would be as a view model. That we need something else to drive our domain. Because the domain logic, when you start looking at asking for sorting for a lot of programs, for a lot of users, and, and you want to sort of hit you with six, seven, eight business rules, and you have to evaluate the content, evaluate where they are, evaluate if the next episode is available, as, and so forth. Uh, writing that query was not very fun, even though we tried. Um, and then we looked at Cosmos DB and Graph API. For some of this, Graph API could be very nice to see, OK, people have watched this, I've also watched this, and, and you can sort of navigate that one. Um, and then actor modeling uh, was something we looked at. It felt that perhaps if, if, if each user is an actor, um, we get to sort of sort and deal with content for that user individually. That, that could perhaps fit. Uh, we also looked at Azure Functions, but at the end of, oh, are we making an actor system in Functions? There was no durable functions at that time. And it sort of clicked when we came to the realization that a uh, favorite might be able to sort itself. If it gets enough input, it can do it uh, fairly easy. And then we can have six or seven method calls, each Im uh, implementing a single business rule. So we evaluate one business rule at a time based on some event instead of trying to evaluate all business rules when we're sorting it. Oops. Um, yeah. And that left us with these three. Um, these are probably the most uh, the famous uh, actor systems on .NET. Uh, you have Acca.net. Um, um, we have people in, uh, using Acca in NRK. Um, and then we have ProtoActor. Uh, we discarded that fairly quick. Uh, the documentation was not there at the time. We felt that the updates in GitHub were not quite as frequent as we would like, and especially lack of documentation on C Sharp uh, was uh, not encouraging. Uh, and then Orleans, um, we could most likely implement this in ACA.NET as well. But we like the Orleans virtual actor uh, paradigm, where you don't control the life cycle. You don't sort of, I don't have to explicitly go and create and have a three and hierarchy of actors. I sort of just ask for my actor. And that is because we have a catalog of about uh, one and a half, two million programs when you look at TV and radio. And if I could just ask for it without knowing if it existed or not, and just get it if it was there, uh, fine. Um, so we felt that the, the model was, was um, in Orleans suited us. <coughs> so Orleans um, consists of two things. There's uh, a runtime uh, and a programming paradigm. A, a sort of a model you work with. Uh, and, uh, and runtime are called silos. And then you have grains, which is what you program around, which is the sort of the, the fundamental building block. Um, there's a talk uh, by Ruben Bond, uh, who works with Orleans. Um, 
where th this slide is from, um, which is a nice introduction to Linz. So grain is a virtual actor. They always exist, or, or they just exist up here when you need them, and you don't really deactivate them. The life cycle is controlled by Linz, and, and sort of when you don't use it anymore, you don't use it. Uh, it's uh, effectively a distributed object. You just have an instance that's running on some silo, some server, somewhere. Um, and it's a sort of a unit of computation, uh, implementation of the, the interface and state. Uh, and they communicate by sending and receiving messages, just like other actors. Um, and then they react to incoming messages. And unless you do something special and you wanted to do something special, they do one thing at a time. Uh, it's just very comfortable very easy to reason about. They often represent objects in a domain. As I said, when we just first started thinking about it, we thought that perhaps a user would be an actor and that would be it, and it would the user would have favorites and, and uh, uh, what their history. But then we sort of felt, realized pretty soon that that would be too big of an actor. So, so a sort of big thing when you start working and having fun with this is to, to um, select the right granularity, get the right size of them. So now, uh, if you have watched the show, uh, that position in that show would, for you would be one actor. If you have a favorite, that would be one actor as well. Um, yeah, so a grain, it has an identity. That's how you sort of interact with it. You need to have the key to the actor to interact with it. You cannot say, give me all of Harold's favorites unless you have some of doing that, so you have to sort of build that yourself. Um, and then there's behavior, which is sort of the implementation of the class, and then there's a st optional state that may be just existing in memory for the time you have the actor alive, or it may be persisted in some storage. Um, and you sort of define one. Here I say I have a user. It uh, has a string key. Um, you can send the message uh, from a sender with a body, and you can list all the messages uh, that actor has. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of wrapping problem. But um, there's the implementation. Um, the state is injected by the system. Uh, so you have a grain state from the store messages, uh, which is a list of messages, and then you can send a message. There's a, a regular uh, async await pattern. Um, nothing special. Easy to reason about this as well, I think. And you use it by calling get grain, and what you actually get is a proxy, uh, more or less, uh, uh, an implementation of that interface. You can call it from the client, and then you can list the contents. Um, so, so this looks like normal code. What happens is that this might run on a to completely different uh, server. Um, so you have to be a little bit aware that um, when you interact with these grains, there is so, um, possible network latency uh, and so on. And then, so what we really think of it is, is as a sort of you have a bunch of instances running somewhere in your, on your cluster, um, and, you, and you work with them. So how do you model for this? When we started modeling, we, uh, we looked at the access pattern for our API. How will we, our API use this? Um, and that's, again, you cannot query except by the ID of a grain, so that so it makes it important to match it with your, um, with your API surface. Uh, so we looked at our documentation, sort of which user event, which uh, system events or, or domain events uh, do we have. And, and the ones we will look at uh, are mark as favorite, delete favorite. You can list all the favorites. And then there's a, a case where we want to uh, enrich another view where we don't really have a list to work from, but we get a lot of show IDs and we need to sort of look up, is this a favorite or not? Uh, positions as well, we set a position, you can delete a position and or resume watching, uh, you can list them as well. 
Uh, and a, uh, if you have watched enough of a show, we might want to turn it into a favorite for you. That leaves us with one decision. Based on the limitations in indexing of actors, uh, uh, do we want to read from the actor model or and use it, the actor model as an active cache? Uh, Olin's call that pattern smart cache, where at least the actor model is your domain model and persistence is just something that happens. Or should we sort of use our actors as a domain model, but then create a view model uh, based on all the state changes, uh, like more CQRS pattern. So we could have those queries uh, where we want to uh, select some, say, get all uh, favorites for Harold, uh, skip 10, continue. Well, we, we wanted the caching, so we decided, okay, let's go with trying to use the actor model as, uh, as, an, uh, as an actor model and, and, and not have a, uh, a separate uh, read model. And we sort of split it, okay, we have catalog. And this is, uh, this is uh, outside data. Uh, this is uh, a cache um, of data uh, from our other systems. And we want to have that close to our own data. And we wanted to make sure that we are up even if the other system is down. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, uh, Sam Newman talks about this microservice book and, and also uh, the inside-outside data uh, paper by Pat Helen touches on this. And then you have uh, sort of the favorites. So we knew that, okay, we have favorites uh, thing and position as well. Um, and let's look at details. So the catalog, um, we have multiple sources for content. We have podcasts, we have TV series, we have live radio, etc. And some of them use various ID schemes. And we did not want to deal with that, so we sort of decided fairly quickly on, let's just map everything into our own IDs. So we take an external ID and map it into a GUID. So we deal with only GUIDs down in the catalog item. And then there's the catalog item, which can be a um, podcast or a series episode uh, or, or, or a movie, like a, a single program. Now, these are things that are used by uh, across all users, uh, across all uh, server ins uh, instances. And um, then there's a concept called stateless, uh, which means that there's a grain. Normally, a grain can only be activated on one server at a time. So, so we, it's running on one, one um, silo, and, and the silos know where it's on. So they have a grain uh, reference, and they look it up and say, OK, this one is running on this server. So if you want this one, go, go over there. But then you have these stateless ones, which can run on uh, multiple uh, servers in the cluster. And you can also allow them to run, have multiple instances on a server if it's uh, something with high throughput. But these are, we have w so one of these stateless uh, grains run on each uh, of our silos. And they are backed, so they, when they load up, they load the state from the stateful ones we have. And this gives us the throughput we need when a lot of users are working with uh, looking at the same show. Uh, sort of you have some popular shows and you know that, okay, Sunday coming, there's a big thing everyone already watches. Um, so that's, a, that's an important concept to have. Um, and then we have favorites. So we, we sort of list favorites uh, from the API. That means that we, we needed a, a, to have an order on them and, and a list of them. Um, and to not load everything when a user hits us, we thought, that, okay, um, the API is page. The clients, they doesn't really make sense to display 100 items on a, or 1,000 items on a cell phone. So they want, they, they are paging anyway, the clients. So let's just follow that and page it ourselves as well. So a page has a from and to rank. Um, the user favorites has a list of pages and their rank, start and in, uh, end rank. Uh, and then um, when your user hits us, it, it will normally load just the first page. We don't have to load all the data for the user. And then 
it ends up in a favorite. Um, uh, so uh, a call to list favorites may be an instance of the user favorites grain, an instance of the favorite page grain, and then uh, one instance for each of the user favorites will be loaded. Uh, and it's uh, so really nicely and fast. And then we have position, more of the same, um, except that we also group position by series. We need to look up uh, all the positions within a season. So, so, when we, so we need to keep track of that as well. And then we make a grain for it to keep track of that. Um, we can have uh, seasons with 800 episodes in them on, on news, the hourly news on radio. So, so we paging is absolutely necessary. And once we change something here, it will sort itself and update the pages and, and uh, keep track of that. Uh, another thing is nice is that we don't, you have the persisted state, but we also have state which is not persisted, which is just in memory when we load it up. So for instance, when you're watching something, uh, the clients report to us every 30 seconds, which means that um, the last uh, program episode you watched will be the same for when, once you start watching something. And that means that we don't have to resort it if the user positions know your last, um, what you watched last the time. So some things we can just keep in memory while other things are persisted in state. And then also, uh, this one doesn't really know about the rules for favorites. Uh, but the nice thing here is that the uh, program episode position can message our favorite, and the favorite will then decide, OK, are we in within the business rules for creating a favorite of it? If, you have sort of if you're skipping in a program, or, uh, and you've not really watched anything of it, should we make it a favorite? Probably not. You're not interested. Uh, if you just watch two minutes, yeah. So there's uh, gives us uh, very nice details on how to implement the, the business rules for it. And we feel that working with uh, actors uh, and domain modeling and matching it with the language, our model is originally Norwegian. Our business people talks Norwegian. Our UX people talks Norwegian. So having a actor model in Norwegian enables us to talk with them about the model. They can actually understand it when I say a user favorite or a page or something. They can relate to it. Um, which, I, if I mention a index on uh, shows and Redis, they would look like, index? What's he talking about? What's a hash set? But this is something they can relate to. And then we have the problem of enriching other views. As I said, Orleans is a virtual actor um, uh, model. So if you, if you ask for a grain, for an ID, it will be created. But when we are to enrich a search result, let's say you search for something and we want to mark everything on that search as with a star, we have to actually go and check because we don't know if the grain exists or not. And when we check, the grain gets initialized and gets a state. So to avoid that, we, um, we ended up using something called a bloom filter. Uh, it's a probabilistic data structure where you can sort of verify if something is in a set or not. So what happens is that you hash something um, with, uh, let's say, you hash it twice with different seeds. So you get two values. You have a bit array. So if I hash this boot and, and I get uh, 26 and 46, I mark bit 26 and 46 in that array. So when I want to look it up, OK, I hash it. Are these two bits marked? If not, I'm not going to load the grain. If it is, I load the grain. Uh, and that makes it uh, quite cheap to check large sets for my content. So state. State uh, uh, in Orleans can be provided by a number of um, um, sources. Uh, it comes built in with uh, table storage is probably the most common one. Um, you can do in memory, of course. Uh, nice for testing, uh, but it supports Cassandra, DynamoDB. Uh, I know some guys who implemented BigQuery uh, to power it. 
Uh, we are mostly using table storage. We used Cosmos, but find that table storage is sufficient fast enough uh, if we do some spreading of data. And uh, very cheap. <coughs> Since we are some working with a system where you living system where you when you deploy, you can have various versions running at the same time. You need to think about worsening of state. And here's a part where I think that having our model and our code in F-sharp is really good because it makes it extremely easy with discriminated unions. So this is our ID mapper green. It has a uh, state. DTO, which is just a, a, a bag for what we call a version state. Um, and the version state is in the middle there. So it's either a version 1 of good, or it's a version 2 of mapper state DTO version 2. And the version 2 uh, has these properties. And then there's a default for it. So we can extend this without breaking anything. We can add a version 3. Everything will run. And that's what we have to do when we, if we want to deploy a new version, we add version 3 and we convert that to version 2 so all clients understand version 3 and knows that there's one and knows what to do with it. And then we're ready, we implement the uh, conversion for it and start running version 3. So this is what we do with uh, when we get uh, a DTO in. We sort of use a pattern matching, see, okay, version 1. If it doesn't have a GUID, well, then we map it to that uh, like this. And then if it does have a GUID, we know it's mapped beforehand. We call it true and sort of, OK, if it's a version 2, it's a version 2. So don't do anything. So having, um, having a good type system really helped us there. I think uh, if you are going to work with actors and, and persisting state, this is something to think about. How will you worsen it if you need to upgrade your grains? How will you do that? Um, yeah. Another thing while we're on the model is that since we are using uh, our actors as an sort of active model, we're reading uh, and writing through it. That makes e-tag and caching extremely simple. When you load a grain from the database, they already have an e-tag. Um, it's a little bit hard to reach, but we can always add our own GUID in memory because we know every time you write to a grain, you uh, do it in a controlled manner, and you can then update it. So this is a really nice side effect and a really good way to offload quite a few of the queries from the clients uh, if you want to. Another thing is uh, <coughs> reporting. Since we are doing these grains where you uh, don't query them, you just access them by ID, uh, doing some counters, etc., means that you have to think about it beforehand, uh, unless you have a storage where you can uh, do analytics on it or something. So what is a, a common pattern is to sort of have grains that aggregate data for you. And so what we do is that we count uh, users, we count favorites, we count uh, uh, positions, how uh, much people have watched. And then we aggregate the, that in stateless grains, which just keep their state in memory. And uh, on each silo uh, in our cluster, we um, sort of do a subtotal, and then we have one stateful grain, which is uh, responsible for um, storing it in the database, as well as emitting the data uh, we're pushing it uh, to metrics as an application insights. Um, well, I've seen people pushing it with signal R and, and getting real-time uh, insights into the system. Um, and also, as we see later on, the dashboard for Orleans is powered by grains as well, doing this kind of thing. So, operations. Um, so we have this system running, and you want to have silos running all the time controlled, and that fits fairly well with Kubernetes. Um, so we build uh, Docker images uh, in TeamCity, 
we push it up with Octopus Deploy. And in our system, we have ended up with four uh, the images, one for the client API uh, that is going away or, or has gone away already. We merged it, getting back to that later. Uh, there's a user change, so all the writes go through service bus and we have a separate worker picking up things from working bus and, and writing to the system. And then we have all the internal cat changes to the catalog which we also listen to and, and update our own cache. Um, this is deployed to Kubernetes, where we have uh, an external um, Vornish Nginx setup allowing us to use a strangler pattern when we break up our monolith. Uh, it hits our web API ingress and then we have a uh, deployment uh, for the web API, for deployment for user changes in silo host. And on each deployment you sort of have the pods running uh, doing the actual work. Uh, so we can have, uh, we have just have a few web APIs and then we can have a few silo hosts and scale those separately. And deploying this is uh, a little bit of a history. Uh, we have, uh, let's say we have version 23 running. Uh, all good and fine. Uh, this is comfortable. And we want to have uh, version 24. So once we activate that deployment in the clusters, we activate them in the same namespace in Kubernetes and they uh, connect uh, to the other silos, they start getting uh, production tra traffic. That means that you might have version 1 or, uh, of something here and version 2 of a state here. So what Orleans does is that you, if you change your interfaces, you need to sort of uh, make sure that uh, it doesn't mix all the new data, you version the interfaces with an attribute uh, and then if a uh, grain is activated here on silo 3 and um, a request comes in from a client which needs a new version. Orleans will take it down. It has a message inbox which Orleans will keep, activate that grain on a new silo and complete your request. And that means that you can do deployments without anyone noticing. Uh, so there will be, you shouldn't really notice. What you can notice is that um, there might be uh, a bit more access on your data layer, um, on the database, uh, once it starts unloading and loading grains again. Um, another thing is that test, you really, when you start putting things into production, you really want to be sure that you don't want to roll back. So we uh, have a problem now that we perhaps do a bit more, too much testing. So we fail something or we decide, okay, well let's not roll forward and we will roll backward. And then we will, all the production traffic we had on these silos will then have to be moved down to the old ones. And it's uh, uh, not where, it doesn't feel right. So we, I think we need to do more testing in a pre-production environment. And we need to test it when both are running. And we need also to test it fairly well with only the new one running. So we need to sort of in our pre-production environment probably shut it down uh, and take it up so it only gets fresh state to see what happens. Uh, because you're not really sure if uh, when we're talking to this one, yeah, I know my data, my user data will be on this one, but if it's using reference data or some other data I have on that server, you can't really control um, unless you're sort of writing uh, a plugin for it. So deploying this is uh, um, it's working well, but it is not something to be taken lightly. Okay, so um, uh, another part of this is how is this running? When you uh, start with Orleans, uh, there's a plugin for a dashboard, uh, which I recommend. Uh, this is not for our operations people, this is for the developer. We use it uh, quite a lot. It gives you a good feeling of how the system is running. It doesn't take a long time until you sort of get a feeling of how these numbers should look. It tells you how many 
active, active grains you have. Uh, it tells you how many silos you have. The uh, error rate, uh, if we goes b go beyond 0 0.01 or so, we there's a problem we have done. There's not a system, basically. It's, uh, if, if, if we've not done anything stupid in our code, uh, that should be 0 0.00. Uh, and then you also have the response time and request per second. And these are internal requests between all the grains, so they will be a lot higher in our API. We see that in, uh, in peak hours we do about internally 2,000, 3,000 requests per second, uh, while the API is, is doing significantly less than that. Um, and you see it also, the most called grain, it would be our cached, our stateless grains, which are used by everyone. You can drill down into the grains. You can see a list of all the grains, how many activations you have, the throughput and the latency for, for them. And then you can also drill down into a single grain and you get all the sort of interface methods and how many calls they have and the latency for each of them. Um, it's very nice to have when you develop and, and get, a, get to know your system. We then also feed this data uh, into application insights. Um, so this is from uh, evening last week. Um, we do about, on the API side, side 3 million requests, um, translate to 40 requests per second, so uh, not that much. But what we are extremely happy about is the exceptions. This is with deployments. And uh, there's, uh, yeah, not much to say that we are extremely happy with having that low number on a public API. Uh, and the response time is 29 milliseconds, uh, also something we're happy about. And Application Insights is just a plugin. We have uh, filtered it a bit, um, to get not to get too much data, but something you just add to a lens. It has uh, uh, a lot of hooks uh, for for yeah, storage, for uh, streams and queues, for uh, analytics, etc. And this is another feature we've implemented. Um, I don't know if, if you were to the uh, uh, observability and distributed systems, but it's basically the same. So we take the operation ID, uh, application insights set on uh, the uh, .NET Core Web API request, we add that operation ID into Orleans, and then we can enable uh, logging. So we get the full insights in. If I call this uh, an external endpoint, I get the full list of operations we're doing inside with all the grains to see what's happening. Um, and we've had to use that one or two times uh, to, to see we're doing something stupid. Um, So, lessons learned. Um, it's been very different when you're sort of not used to actor and start working with it. Very fun. Uh, uh, I think um, we benefited a bit from having, or, or a lot from having F Sharp as a model. It's uh, uh, been very testable. Um, we do property based testing and model based testing. So, w our unit test coverage is a lot smaller than, than what I'm used to. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the fact that we can talk about the model and reason about it with our product owners and, and, and UX people is, uh, is uh, um, also something that's very valuable. We have spent quite a time at performance. And there's a lot of buttons once you start doing these distributed systems. Uh, we <coughs> I had a problem with storage. The storage needs to be able to keep up to speed with whatever you're doing. Um, you can do that by sharding. You can place different kind of data and different kind of storage. And then we have lifecycle, uh, which we'll get back to. Um, and then there's placement. Uh, now, when we uh, have a user, uh, and we want to we know that okay, for a request or user, normally we load quite a few grains. If you can keep that user on one separate server, on one silo, uh, it will save a lot of network and IO latency. 
So in Orleans, you can either write what's called a placement director. So you sort of write some code. We could perhaps use the user ID to say, OK, have a static hash and put a user on a, uh, on a silo. Or you can use something which is built in and say, that OK, I prefer that all activations from this grain will be activated on the same silo. So that means that we can, uh, we know that when a user hits us, we are normally just doing memory operations. There's no serialization involved. There's no network, uh, et cetera. Then you have these cache grains, uh, very useful. Uh, makes it really fast and nice. So if you, <coughs> if you uh, have some shared data, use it. The model, not everything needs to be persisted. You can probably do something just in memory while the grain is active and some in uh, state uh, persisted storage. Like I said, just keeping track of the last thing you watch will can save us a lot of uh, operations because we know we're not going to have to change any sorts because you're still watching the same thing, so it will still be at the top of your my content. And then Kubernetes. Uh, Yes, it is uh, nice and shiny, uh, but nobody, or, or not that many, are that good at running it already or operating it. Uh, there are some, but you don't necessarily find them. And then there's the number of silos. So how, how, many, how many servers do we need to, to do our traffic? Um, and, and basically, there's just a lot of things to turn on, and we seem that if we, okay, we find one bottleneck and, and then we get some more speed and then you find a new one. And, and so something you have to work with and, and keep track of. Item potency. We, all our write operations are item potent. That has saved us when we migrated four years of state from uh, the old solution for NRK TV. There's about 40, 50 gigabytes of data we needed to import. Uh, we had a bug. Uh, luckily, we had item potencies. We can just run everything uh, and do the whole import fixed for those 82,000 or, or 20,000 users which had a problem. Just re-import everything while the system was running and nobody noticed except that, okay, they got their missing favorites. So very nice thing. Uh, happy that we did that. Didn't see it coming that clearly. <coughs> Deadlock, uh, yes. The grains are single-threaded, but that means also if you're doing <laughs> calls <laughs> back and forth, you will end up probably deadlocking yourself. We have done that. Uh, it was uh, not as easy as that one, but um, sort of a grain is doing one thing. It communicates with other via messaging, and if you're doing one thing from one grain, it's busy, and, and you sort of end up in that lock. Uh, possible. Yeah. Oh. And then we have this. We have learned a about, lot about how to run Kubernetes and how not to run Kubernetes. We uh, were close to take out down the main website because uh, we needed to test our migration. We used all the memory on the server. There was no memory left to the other applications. Kubernetes started killing things. They did not kill us first. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think it's right for us to run on Kubernetes, but it's uh, still something one needs to think about. Um, then, uh, yeah, and this, this was where we actually killed things. So, we have these position grains, which we know get a ping from the user every 30 seconds as long as you are watching something. If it gets a delay for more than, let's say, a minute, we know the user is not watching anymore. Why should we keep it in memory? Just throw it out. So with Orleans taking care of the life cycle, uh, you have to think of how long should a grain be allowed to live in memory. I think we had about 8 million grains in memory when we're doing the import. Uh, and then things went bad. Uh, and then we said, OK, let's, let's adjust the lifetime. Some things you might want to have longer. Let's say the user favorite entry point can live for a day, no problem. Uh, perhaps a page for a user can live for a day, but not the 
positions and the favorites. So after we adjusted the lifetime for those down to a few minutes, we could rerun the whole import. We never activated more than 1.7 million uh, grains. And we uh, did not destroy everything else. Um, so adjusting lifecycle can really help on, on the memory and, and the speed of the system. Logging is a passion that can kill you. When you do these dependency tracing and you do not sample, you will have a lot of data. And uh, we added sort of double the daily volume where we report to application insights in just a few hours. And then uh, we have some s limits on application insights. So we started throttling us uh, and everything went bad. Uh, first of all, our system went slow because we were just sending too much data to application insights, saturating the network. And then, uh, oh, uh, yeah, everything was horrible. Uh, and so we needed to sort of turn down what we log, we needed to turn on sampling. Uh, and uh, so what it was was that we actually, by, by accident, uh, did dependency tracing for all calls. Uh, so all the grain chains were logged to application insights. So that killed us pretty good. Um, and then there's this concept of direct clients. So I said we're, we're moving away from having the web API as a separate deployment in Kubernetes. We are moving it into the same process as the Orleans silo hosts. And the reason for that is that the client does not know where a grain resides. That is kept in uh, a grain reference, a static hash set uh, with buckets uh, on each silo. So to know where a grain lives, and which server you need to talk to, you need to talk to a server first. And then you sort of get, okay, I want to talk to something which is on silo three, you call silo two. Uh, and then silo 2 doesn't have it, but points to silo 3, and you go and get it, and it takes time. So we, uh, I think it was last week, deployed to production where we host our web API uh, together uh, with the Orlean silo. Um, and that normally reduces at least one network hop. Um, the change is perhaps not that clear on the graph, but when you look at the average response times, <coughs> Um, this was a very nice thing uh, for us. And then uh, uh, finally we have storage. We, um, we started out with, uh, with uh, Cosmos DB and that is very fine. You can scale Cosmos DB, you drag a slider, you pay a bit more, you pay after a while quite a bit more. Um, and uh, and you get the, the sort of uh, the throughput you need. What happens is that Cosmos DB starts putting up uh, physical partitions, uh, and then all your request units are sharded or just um, I think they're divided sort of equally amongst all those partitions, and that's fine for our import. It it, it made sense. We could just read through uh, four years of data in a few hours. But when we wanted to scale down again, you have all these partitions. You're not getting rid of them because you cannot control how Cosmos DB scales up and down the physical partitions. And now we suddenly have a lot of physical partitions because you need that to get the throughput. So when you reduce the throughput, you don't have enough per partition. So, and then it is, uh, slightly expensive. Um, so we, we went over to table storage. And what we do is that we uh, have a separate storage account for different grain types. So position, which is what we're absolutely recording the most of, will have a separate storage account so we know the throughput we get for that. And then we have some other grains in other partitions. And uh, I, I think that saves us uh, 100,000 a year at least. Um, so that is something to be aware of to keep the storage up to speed. And now I feel I dumped a whole lot of things on you. Questions? Yes? Do you also feed data into your personalization from the outside world, so to speak, from other data sources? 
Uh, the question is, if we do we all also feed data uh, to personalization from other data sources? Uh, no, this one is just for keeping track of your content. For uh, recommendations and machine learning, etc., we use uh, um, we use other setups for that. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, okay, we have these grains that aggregate everything, uh, and what happens if uh, you get a request for some new data which you do not already have? As so forth, yeah. Uh, well, then uh, we have service bus. So we take a copy of the messages and feed them off uh, to, uh, to a separate table storage we can scan. Um, we also, when we have Cosmos DB, we can query it. But uh, if not, that is a problem in sort of uh, having, um, and that's why I think you see in when people start discussing actor system that uh, event sourcing is not that uncommon, that they build this around event sourcing just to keep all the events, because then you can just replay the events. If not, you need to be able to query for it. And with table storage, we, we will have to scan it, and the data in table storage, uh, except for the uh, partition key and row key, will be binary encoded. So of course, we can binary decode it. It's open source, so we know how that works, but it's still a bit of work. So that is something to be to spend some time on, thinking about which business requirements, what do I need to answer to, to, to the business. Well, yeah? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, so the question is, um, how do we feel about uh, having the, the business rules uh, spread all over, or, or how do they actually work? Um, I think, that first of all, you have sort of one business rule. It is normally a, sort of you will find one method responsible for doing that. So it's very testable, I think. Um, and uh, we are... Also, I think it's fairly easy to, t to, to change and reason about. What is different, uh, or what you need to think of, is that we cannot change things back in time. Unless, of course, you have an event log, you can replay it. But so if you, if you want to change the rule for, for when we move from, okay, you have watched 50% of a show, uh, let's make it a favorite, to you have watched 60%, that can only be done for new things. So that is... Uh, but that's for our case, that is actually what we want. We don't want to change your sorting uh, um, retrospectively. So but I, I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, fairly, I don't feel it's a problem. Well, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>